Thank you very much for the introduction. And also, thanks a lot for the, uh, the organizers for inviting me and giving me the chance to, to give a talk here. So I, I want to talk about something that is um, connected to, to metamaterials, but from an entirely different um, point of view. Um, lucky enough, we had so many talks already over the course of this week that I basically don't need an introduction anymore. What I want to talk about in detail. But uh, first of all, so I just want to quickly mention um, that this is a collaboration with Dio and, and Mitch and um, also Antoine Mellet and Marius Matiakis in, in Harvard. Um, and um, so let's, let me get started. So the, the idea behind uh, what I want to present you quickly today is that well, we got, got interested in, in surface plasma polaritons that were in beautifully introduced yesterday in, in great detail. Um, and in particular, due to the fact, at least for me, because I am um, a scientific computing person, because it actually scales, it creates a huge scale separation. So um, the, the surface plasma and polariton wavelength is usually much smaller than any ambient um, wave feature. So basically, in, in any numerical computation that you do, you, you get a, a quite significant um, well, scale separation in it. And this is mainly due, and uh, um, this is the level of um, to which I will do um, atomistic modeling here, namely none at all, um, due to an effective surface conductivity where um, we have a huge uh, imaginary part compared to, to the real part. Um, and so what I want to, to show is, is basically a, a bit of work that we did over the course of the last um, one and a half years on, on, say, the question when you stack, um, say, 2D materials or, or conducting interfaces for me, because I'm really not going into the atomistic scale here, but I'm not putting them atomistically on top of each other, but I keep a a certain spacing or distance that's typically on the order of like 50 nanometers or 100 nanometers, so they are quite separate. So the goal is a little bit to to understand maybe maybe plasmonic devices in in this region of so between meso and and macro scale effects. In particular, um, what is interesting about about such stacked features is that one can actually create um, an optical device with effective material parameters that, that have very unusual um, optical properties. And, and one example I will, I will focus on uh, in this talk today is, is the so-called epsilon near zero effect, where basically in, um, we, we get something like an, an effective permittivity tensor and, and one or two eigenvalues of these these permittivity tensor are close to zero. And then what happens is basically that an electromagnetic wave, so here down here I have a Hertzian dipole, and in here I have my stacked material just um, warps through that material without any, any phase delay. And I just want to, to understand that from a analytical and scientific computing side. Um, so what got us started in that was actually a question we get from, from, got from our collaborators at, at Harvard. It's basically whether we could, we could try to, to work a little bit on, on such a simple configuration, so just um, simple infinite sheets, and we, we assume a, a actually a constant surface conductivity on, on those sheets. And in between, we somehow have a heterogeneous permittivity that just depends on x, and x is the vertical axis on it. And well, the goal was to understand well, if, if there are there effective properties in it, assuming uh, a certain scale separation. And so mm, what we did is, well, uh, when you try to, to understand this problem at first, it's just simplified as much as possible. So um, when you just look at this and say, well, we are mainly interested in, in TM polarization, so we just assume that for the electric and magnetic field. And um, 
in, so we, we also assume a, a certain propagation in the z direction, the y direction has been being kept invariant, so we reduce it to 2D, and um, well, in the moment I want to somehow propagate through that material, I also have to assume s a certain form of periodicity, and uh, Bloch wave ansatz is exactly the right thing for it. So the moment I propagate from one layer to the other, I will somehow somehow pick up a phase shift and so I have two unknowns in the system here. This is the wave number Kz for propagation in, in plane and Kx for propagation through it. And then naturally you can ask the question, so um, for what combination of Kx and Kz can I actually propagate through that material? And then just writing out the Ronskin of the system gives you actually a dispersion relation where um, for basically a fundamental solution of a second order equation enters. So that you simply solve. And the, the beauty about that is you can also give it to an undergrad. They're happy to do uh, thousands of parameter studies for you. And then you end up with nice pictures. And um, so we looked at the thing. Um, and one thing we, we, um, we were quite interested in is can we actually see this epsilon near zero effect in it? Um, because that, that is a priori just a dispersion relation. So we get dispersion bands about propagating waves. And so what we did is we, we just expanded near, near the zero of the Brion zone. And um, by doing that, one sees that well, this is the first order expansion uh, can, be, can be expressed uh, in some way by the fundamental solution. And we have to talk about derivatives of that. But all of that has closed expressions due to the fact that around, around k star, everything is nice. And by, by doing that and, and just seeing, oh, we, we have this parameter here. And keep in mind, sigma is mainly imaginary. So if you make it purely imaginary, that's a positive value. That is, is a, it's also a positive value. So you can just somehow equate that to 0. And then um, to doing some analysis here, we, we see that well, we actually get some bifurcation points. So at a critical spacing of my stacked material, I actually end up with, with something where the, the, this dispersion relation, um, the, the, the first, first um, derivative breaks down. And this, this actually corresponds then to, to, to um, so-called plasmonic Dirac points. So in, instead of having, having the, the usual dispersion band, which is, is mainly parabolic, we, we, have a, um, we have a region where we actually have linear dispersion then um, at a critical spacing d star. And um, looking into, into this dispersion relation a little bit more, um, one can also justify writing out something like an effective permittivity corresponding to it, where, um, where we basically were averaging over the permittivity in x direction. And then we had a contribution from the surface conductivity. I think, um, so let me, let me comment on, on one thing in here. It's, it's that this is actually sufficient to, to explain why we actually seen this epsilon near zero effect simply because we have we, we end up with a permittivity tensor that where we can by manipulating d um, actually just drive those values here close to zero and then we, we exactly see this propagation. But now what is what is interesting when you look at it for for more than a second is that this somehow looks like an, an averaging process. So there's an average here. So this is a little bit hidden here. Um, but, but nevertheless, it, it looks like an averaging. And um, I, I, well, I, with a little bit of, of training in homogenization theory, I thought mm, that there should be something that is more general that basically covers exactly this effective permittivity or this notion of an effective <coughs> permittivity. And this is actually where we, we then started to to um, look at this problem a little bit more from the, the analytic side. So now we are, let's say we, we ramp up the, the difficulty a little bit. And I, I know that most of these assumptions here are a little bit artificial in the sense that um, 
in the sense that you can't probably can't realize in real materials, but nevertheless, it's it's kind of nice to to think about it a little bit. What would happen if? So let's say we have the following configuration. We just we have a unit cell and we have some interface in it. So it's 2D in a 3D volume, and we assume that there's a surface conductivity on it given by a uh, conductivity tensor sigma, and then we have a permittivity tensor epsilon. And um, well, what we're doing uh, now, assuming, is that we have, have the usual um, assumption in, in, in all of the, the homogenization theories. Basically, you have a small spatial variance in x, so it can be different over there when you're here. And, but it, it has some, some rapid oscillation that is, in that case, now scaled with x over d, and in which you assume periodicity. So you have some local periodicity that we will exploit, and, but when you move somewhere else, it can actually look different. And, um, and now the question is, well, how does, how does actually well, an electromagnetic wave in such a material where this is just copied in, in every direction, um, uh, how would it behave? And um, yeah, I have to comment on, on one thing um, first. When, when you look at this, so this is typical. But what is a little bit peculiar here is that I also scale the sigma with d. Because what I want to do is now is I want to, I want to introduce a scale separation, namely d, which is the, the parameter that, that, um, that characterizes the periodicity will be very small compared to the ambient wavelength. Um, and I, I have to make a choice how to scale d. And for the, the purpose of the, these plasmonic crystals we wanted to study, we, we chose the following scaling, namely that we keep the ambient wavelength at 1. But um, we, we want to somehow force that the surface plasma and polariton structures get smaller and smaller. So um, and because of that, we scale the, the surface conductivity. Um, or put a different way, the coupling strength between two layers will, will remain constant in this system. And then, well, it's, I think it's finally time to write out some, some PDEs. So um, I will look at time harmonic Maxwell's equations. And um, and I will, will add the following, that on every of these layers, I actually force a jump condition in the tangential part of the, the magnetic field. And by doing that, um, I can do um, some, some two-scale analysis, where we can prove that a little bit more rigorous as, as well. And we did, but um, let me just walk you through this gigantic slide for a second. So we start with our microscope scale model here. We do a formal multi-scale expansion. We also expand the derivative that you in see here. And then you, you can just sort it by orders of d. And then um, when you start um, equating and closing the system, you actually end up with the following, namely that the whole PDE is, is actually governed by, um, again, time harmonic Maxwell's equations. but with one important difference, it is now I don't have the, the real spatially varying permittivity in it anymore. This is um, replaced by an effective permittivity tensor. And I also don't see my microscopic conducting interfaces anymore. And this, permit, this permittivity tensor is then again given by, well, an average minus the other average. And this is actually now the, the full answer to the question is when I want to compute this effective permittivity that came out quite easily in the block wave approach. Actually, this is the right, the right quantity I have to compute. And one peculiar thing actually shows up here. It's namely that I have a, I have a chi in here, which is a so-called corrector. So um, it's not just the arithmetic average. I have to correct it with a certain quantity. And this is subject to a solve problem. In the interest of time, I will not comment too much on it. I just want to say that this is, is again, a, a Helmholtz-type problem. So it, and it will encode one thing, namely, this is the contribution of surface plasma resonances in my, actually, my cell problem that somehow enter this effective, this effective value. So just to, to say that, to, 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 to make the point again, so I now have an average here, and I have another average. And unfortunately, there's no d in it anymore, because I, I'm, I rescale everything. 
So, um, but so I can tune this average by spacing or by, by tuning the conductivity. And what I can do, or the hope here is again that I can drive one or two of the, the um, eigenvalues of the permittivity tensor close to zero. Quick question, how many, what time do I have left? Okay. If, if D is lost, yes. does that mean your actual computer results don't depend on the ratio of the wavelength to D? Oh, they do, but they're, they're, it's just rescaled into the sigma. So it's just due to the fact that um, what happens here is that I, I look at this in, in, in a limit of, of D to zero, but um, I use the result, of course, for a finite value of D. So. Um, I, I will. I have an example for that, but let, let me just let me just show you a pretty picture that that brings the point across. So when I have say a scaling of of d equal to two to the power of minus four, and these are arbitrary values in here, and I start halving. You see, you see how the the electromagnetic wave actually so how how the scattering configuration changes, and this is the homogenization result. So in this limit for, for larger and larger scale separation, I will actually converge into, into this homogenization result. And then, of course, the question is for any real spacing D, how, how bad do I do if I just use this homogenization result here? And maybe in the um, in interest of time, I would just comment very quickly on um, when, when you look at configurations like nano ribbons actually the fact that you create um, that you create um, um, something that's non, not a flat sheet in it will create a, a huge corrector and this corrector actually sees exactly the surface plasma and resonances that will show up in your effective permittivity um, okay and then let me skip to to one last point I want to make is that the obvious question is how good are we actually doing if we um, if we compare that to finite size structures, ultimately we want to use it without resolving things too much. And so we also looked at just configurations of four or eight layers and then just compute the whole thing um, with whatever means necessary. And then I compared against the homogenization result. And kind of the, 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 the result is that the deviation for something like four layers is, is about 10% at a certain critical frequency and then goes down. And then for eight layers, I'm actually going down quite a bit. So this is actually a pretty, pretty nice result. So I can get something on average than less than 1% deviation for a huge frequency range. And only at around a certain f critical frequency, I have about 10% of. N equals eight is basically wavelength D ratio? Yeah, N equal four just says that it has, um, it has four layers. I'm sorry, I, I skipped that detail. Altogether or per wavelength? No, just altogether. Four layers, nothing else. Now, interested in in that case in the complementary transmission through the system of just four layers with fixed size, and this also works nicely for um, ribbons, where then I of course see the first resonance and higher resonances in it, and but uh, the the error is also quite well controlled, I would say. Okay, and this is about as much as I I wanted to present today. So just to conclude maybe in one sentence, I showed you two different approaches of, of trying to understand um, um, the assay, say plasmonic crystals. One was a, a block wave approach, the other one was a, well, well not quite, a, a, an asymptotic analysis for, for it. And then um, also some, some preliminary finite size, as a comparison to finite size configuration to show that it, it might have some merit. So the finite size configuration was actually done with um, real material parameters. So um, I'm quite happy about that. And with that, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.